Matthew, how's everything going? I'm great, man. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I, I thank you for coming on because uh, your your book, I think, has been a, an eye opener for a lot of people. Now, th I mean, fiat food is like a concept that we've all talked about and so on. But I think you, you've re really written something that is very well researched, um, sort of goes step by step. Uh, and I want to talk about that. But before we get to that, let's let's start with you. Who are you and why should people listen to you? And why did you write, decide to write this book? As a disclaimer, I'm not sure anybody should ever listen to me, <laughs> but who I am is um, I've been a journalist since I've been about 17, and I started out writing my own newspaper uh, when nobody would hire me in my small town of Danville, Pennsylvania, and I don't have any formal education. My dad was a college professor, um, but I dropped out of high school to pursue writing and journalism, and I moved to New York City. Um, where I shuffled around a bit, scrapping, clawing, climbing, uh, until eventually I landed a job at the New York Daily News, which at the time was the fifth biggest paper in the country. And my job specifically was, I was the crime reporter. So anytime anything broke across the country, I'd be deployed, I'd parachute in, and it, especially mass shootings, uh, my job mm -hmm. was to always find the motive. So as an investigative crime re reporter, I developed a certain skill set over the years of doing it, which I think came out, you know, came really relevant for me in terms of, of this book, Fiat Food, where <laughs> um, I, I had to really sort through some narratives that were being pushed down our throats that were very well funded but very dangerous. Well, so tell me about that. How, how did you get interested in this topic in the first place? Like it's, it's not something that like a crime reporter and Fiat, it just doesn't, where's the connection? How, how'd you get into it? Yeah. I think there's certain former colleagues of mine who are a little confused about this turn I made because I was a very respected mainstream journalist. I've appeared on Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, Good Morning America. I mean, I've written for the New York Times. I've Guardian. So I, I, like, what has happened to Matt Leshack? How did he go down this <laughs> rabbit hole? Well, like a lot of people, I think uh, COVID changed things for me quite a bit. So I've interviewed powerful people my whole life, and I've been in their proximity. And I've always had this understanding that, you know, these people lie quite a bit, but they do so to further their own power. And it's not at the expense of the people. It's sort of this relationship where we have these, I've learned, where we have these authorities in power and they don't want to hurt us. They really want us to do well, but they're going to lie to get there. They're going to fudge things. They're going to create a narrative. And... As a, as a reporter, I always feel like my job was to sort through the narrative, to find the facts, who, what, where, why, when, how, get that to the people. Um, but COVID changed that in the aspect that it became very evident very early on that they didn't have our best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And they weren't even pushing a facade. They, they, they weren't pretending anymore. They'd pulled the masks completely off. And... That led me, I've, I've always had a peripheral interest in economics and I've always been a Austrian. I I've, mm -hmm. have Austrian leanings, but uh, I forget who it was. A friend pointed me to Seyfedin Amus, mm -hmm. who's a legend in my eyes as an economist. <laughs> and I read the Bitcoin standard and I was really, I was really pretty taken back by um, just his ability to communicate very complicated thoughts in a, a, a very, in a way that I could understand him as somebody who was not you know, an economist. But it was the fiat standard that really captured me, in particular, chapter eight. Hmm. So I developed all this respect for SAFE. You know, it's like, <laughs> man, he's, he's brilliant. I've listened to his lectures. I subscribed to his website. And then there's this chapter where he posits what on its face just appeared to be a completely insane theory, this wild conspiracy theory that we've, our food supply has been manipulated by these shadowy agencies. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Like, what? 
Like, I love Safe, but like he he's not a nutritionist. He's not an investigative reporter. What what the fuck is going on here? Yeah, I I, I mean I it, it was a really it, the chapters seem really out of place to me because the first few chapters were these really interesting background narratives on how fiat currency was established. But I get to chapter eight, and it, it was this what on its face seemed absurd uh, chapter mm -hmm. on this really shadowy conspiracy to manipulate the American food supply. So I mean, I, I'm like, what the fuck is this? This is bizarre. <laughs> like safe is obviously really brilliant, but what, what is this? He's not an investigative reporter. Um, he's not a dietitian. Uh, like it was a short chapter, but in it, it was just all these bombs. Uh, so I, I had a lot of respect for safe and I, went like compulsively through fact checking this chapter like <laughs> sentence by sentence and every sentence that goes by i'm becoming more and more infuriated because it's all panning out and mm -hmm. by the time i got to the end i made this conclusion that if anything safe had actually understated the case mm -hmm. so i'm blown away because if this is true if this bears out, this is what I would say is the most consequential, in terms of human life, conspiracy in the past 200 years. And I reached out to SAFE and I'm, I explained who I was, just a cold email, I don't know who the fuck SAFE is, <laughs> just this cold email, I'm like, dude, I, I, read, I read your book, here are my credentials, here's what I've done. <laughs> um, now, I'm, I didn't mention this in my background, but I left journalism in about 2012. I wrote, I began, I transitioned into book writing. Mm -hmm. So I've published with Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, uh, Scholastic, all major publishers, and had great, great experiences. But one thing I realized was that uh, no major publisher was gonna publish this book. Like it, <laughs> it wasn't gonna happen. Because I could imagine explaining this to my agent mm -hmm. and my manager. And then you write the proposal and then you go before these publishing houses and they're going to be like, wait, what? And then, so you published, you know how this is. Mm -hmm. Then it goes through legal and then 18, 18 different editors. And by the time it came out, I realized it'd be this sanitized version of bullshit, which if, if any of them would even, even accepted this book. So mm -hmm. I didn't even try. I went right to say, because the problem I had was, I was thinking, how would I get publicity for this book? How do I get the message out? Because if I write a great book mm. and nobody understands it or hears about it, what's the point? The, mm. the goal as a writer, and, and you know this, is to communicate your ideas. It's like you, you want to make money, you want all these things, but really we're, at the end of the day, just trying to reach other people and communicate our thoughts. Mm. Um, so I reached out to Safe, and I had this idea that he should start his own publishing house. So very brazen I am like, Listen, man, you need to start your own <laughs> publishing house. I should be your first author. Here's my idea. Here's who I am. Here are my credentials. And to my, to my kind of shocked, he, he told me he had already been thinking about starting a publishing house, that this was on his mind. Um, mm -hmm. Because I felt like this solved an area for me where I could reach his readership, mm -hmm. which would negate the need to go to a major publishing house while giving me the literary freedom to follow the story wherever it went regardless mm. of who was involved and where the bodies were. Mm. So I went to work and um, 200 uh, freedom of information requests, hundreds of citations later, I have fiat food. And <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be more proud of how, how it came out. Mm. Well, how, how long did it take for you to actually do the investigation and like actually write the content. I imagine there have been lots of uh, different stones that you've unturned and so on. Um, as an investigative reporter, what, what, what's that process like and how long does, does it take? Um, well, what took a long time for me was sorting through the studies. So I went hmm. and I, I went through many of the nutrition studies to kind of trace back the root at the core, like how did all these like premises become accepted as common sense in mainstream mm. America? And that was time consuming because I'm not a physics guy. Like I don't mm. understand biology very well. So I had to, 
understand how, um, you know, for instance, the hydrogenation process is born mm -hmm. and how the studies sampling is used. And I had to, I'm uh, very fortunate where I found a lot of really great scientists explain to me mm. how these studies are bullshit. Like, <laughs> um, you know, in, in one thing I did not understand that I think your viewers, your audience might already know, I, I didn't, was how there's different kinds of studies and, and most of the studies on health are all run by, or, or they're all something called observational studies, which mm -hmm. can establish association but can't establish a real causal relationship. So it's kind of like me handing out a flyer. So I can hand out flyers to everybody who's had cancer, for instance, and find out that nine out of 10 of them have had milk at some point. So <laughs> then I have a headline that says, milk linked to cancer rates. Now, these headlines aren't meant for other scientists. They will read it and laugh. People mm -hmm. will understand how this works. It's a PR campaign meant for the American public. Mm -hmm. and kind of understanding that was a process for me. It took a little longer than I'd like to admit, but <laughs> I, I write very quickly. Um, I get high on caffeine and, and I can <laughs> consume a lot of information and get it out pretty, pretty quickly. But this took a little longer because there's just so many layers. Mm. All right. So, uh, tell us about food. What, what, what is it that that's surprising? What's the core message that you wanted to tell people with this book? Our, we, we, we are currently in a 55 year old, 55 year gaslighting campaign hmm. that started in, on August 15th, 1971, when Richard Nixon decoupled from gold hmm. and the, you know, it, it was the, 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 the characters in my book are threefold. It's industry who understood that very quickly that meat was not nearly as profitable mm. as selling mass produced Doritos <laughs> where you could churn these things out like fiat currency and at a fraction of the cost you could do so at scale and your profit margin is significantly higher. Probably most interestingly of all is, is the seventh, the, the other character, the other leg on this stool as I like to think is the Seventh Day Adventist Church which was started by somebody named Ellen G. White. Um, this, this church came from the Miller movement. It was a descendant of the Miller movement. And its founder, Ellen, Ellen White, was walking home from school one day as a young girl, gets hit in the head by a rock, knocked unconscious into a state of near coma, as she describes it. But when she woke up, she was becoming, she'd become a vessel for God and was getting all these visions. And God was saying, Ellen, you're right, the end times are coming, the apocalypse is near, and your job is to purify people's bodies and souls. And the way we do this is through repressing the human sex drive, which at the turn of the 19th century was believed to be the sex drive and carnal desires were believed to be responsible for almost every health malady you could think of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the way Ellen went about doing this, and, and she was ironically cor correct, even though a lot of her science was very faulty, was she attributed meat consumption mm. to sex drive. She understood <laughs> this, like others before her had to. Mm. And the way to eliminate sex drive would be to alter the food supply and get people from eating meat which caused sex drive to eating more grains, which repressed sex drive. So she had a young protege named John Harvey Kellogg. She <laughs> tasked him with coming up with a food that could substitute for meat, in particular for breakfast. So if you go back pre-1970, people ate meat, particularly red meat, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, if they mm. could afford it. Mm. A lot of meat consumption. So she was horrified by this. So she wanted John Harvey Kellogg in particular to come up with a breakfast food that could substitute for me to repress the sex drive of humanity to make their spirits pure for heaven, for the coming apocalypse. So he came up with uh, you know, Kellogg's cornflakes and <laughs> it became extremely effective. So I think some people might be wondering, well, what the hell does this have to do with uh, fiat and how did this become... <laughs> 
Like this mm-hmm. is just a weird religious group, right? Like what does this have to do with, with our, our diets today? Well, John Harvey Kellogg, they began all this, this whole meatless revolution and began pushing it. But for, the long, for a while, this was only part of this kind of weird religious group. It was, mm-hmm. it, it was large, but it was kind of looked at as more of a curiosity. Um, John Harvey Kellogg had a protege named Leanna Cooper. She mm-hmm. started the American Dietetics Association, which became the formal wing of the government's food policy in the early mm-hmm. 1900s, moving forward. They invaded home ec classes. They invented home ec classes for school. They worked very hard to formalize nutrition policy within government. But still, come 1970, people are still eating meat. <laughs> so they made some segue. They, they were growing, but they were still very small. Come <laughs> January of 1970, people are still eating meat and animal-based products for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But then everything changed when Nixon decoupled. Because so up until then, people were no longer allowed to redeem their promissory dollars for gold, but foreign nations still could. So this put a powerful restraint on government's ability to just print money. Mm -hmm. Um, because, Because there's a fear that if too many countries redeemed at the same time, the American government would be exposed as a fraud. Because mm-hmm. by 1970, by 1971, there had already been far more paper promissory notes issued than gold we had in our treasury. So all it would have taken was a few countries at the same time to expose the lie that was the American dollar. So Nixon, in a sense, was forced to, forced to decouple mm-hmm. because they, they, they didn't have it. We, we didn't have the gold. Um, but when he did that, America reached a real inflection point where um, we, we, you know, we're going to print all these dollars. We're going to flood the economy with them. But one of the consequences of this, as we've learned throughout history, is when you have more dollars chasing the same or similar amounts of goods, it takes more dollars to get those goods. So at that point, they went on a campaign to alter the entire American food supply. And they did this through many ways. One of them was through the appointment of a guy named Earl Butts as Department of Agriculture head. And he began consolidating America's farms, which used to be made up of all these small farms. His motto was go big or go home. Mm -hmm. And he wanted rows and rows of corn. And now that we had fiat, we were able to incentivize the products that we wanted to steer the American food supply into the direction that we felt was most beneficial to the government. So the government understands that people will deal with corruption and keep voting them into office. There's corruption all the time. We keep voting these idiots in. They'll deal with endless war. I mean, we've been in war for, I think, with the exception of six years, every year since 1970. Mm -hmm. But one thing that people don't deal with is high food prices. They freak out. I'll point to between 2005 and 2007 in Europe, there was more than 12,500 food-related riots. More recently in 2022 in Sri Lanka, you know, the media tried to obfuscate what that was really about, but at its core, meat had gone up by over 100% as had eggs and dairy at a certain point. The people's food supply was, was being diminished by monetary inflation. Hmm. And what ended up happening was they hundreds of thousands of Sri Lankans stormed the palace and the leaders had to flee. So government authorities are always very attuned to uh, how sensitive people are to changes in food prices. Um, Earl Butts even said in an interview that, you know, a woman notices the price of a sofa once every 10 years because that's Mm -hmm. all they really get it. But they go every single week to the grocery store. So this is a problem. Instead of coming clean to the people and saying, look, we're printing all these dollars and we're gonna have to deal with rising food prices, they took a different tact, was, which was to shift the entire food supply. And they did this through direct subsidies to corn, soy, and sugar lobbies. 
and through emboldening groups like the Seventh Day Adventist Church, through tons of fiat funding. For instance, the Seventh Day Adventist State Church, modern day, is is intertwined and runs a university called Global Lind University in California, which in just two years received one hundred and fifty five million dollars in fiat printed subsidies that went directly to fund these observational studies that continuously tell us that meat is bad, that grains mm-hmm. are good. So it's a multifold PSYOP where they're altering our food supply through direct subsidies and then through an informa- information campaign to make us think that the food <coughs> our ancestors have been eating for thousands of years mm. is making us sick while a new, improved like grains and these kind of plastic foods um, are the path to health. And it's been highly effective. Hmm. Well, so there, there's this uh, fiat debasement that causes food prices to rise. So what you're saying is that the government essentially used the printed money to give some of the cheaper stuff a leg up so that people wouldn't necessarily feel the food prices rising. Um, yeah, during and, the and 70s. Exa- exactly. And remember that before fiat, hmm. if the government was going to spend $6 billion and give it to corn, they needed the consent of the public, right? Hmm. They need to either say sell corn bonds maybe or hmm. through direct taxation. Hmm. But by removing the gold standard, they could just print the money without our consent hmm. and send it to these different areas to weaponize it to weaponize the foods, to effectively weaponize uh, corn, soy, and and sugar, and these studies, and corporations didn't need any, any incentive to do this. They were literally just profiting more. Hmm. All these forces worked in tandem to get us to a place where if you walk into Walmart and you look in line, you see hmm. our American populace is sick, like very, very hmm. sick, metabolically hmm. destroyed. And it's not... Hmm. I guess what, one, one thing I really want to express to your audience is it's not by accident. This is a, mm. by design. This is how it, this is the only way it could possibly work absent of them just coming clean and saying that, you know, it's like the food for, for our species, the true the, the food might appear like it's getting cheaper or, or it's rather affordable to people because if you buy a box of cereal for $3 and 95 cents, you could feed, feed yourself all day. But the real nutrients for human for humanity to thrive is shooting up. Meat's becoming a food of the upper class. And it's increasingly, we're in a situation where broader spectrums of the public are eating like 16th century peasants, grains, Mm. but I would say worse with all the chemicals and shit they put in the food. Mm. Um, And they're virtue signaling while doing it while destroying their own health for various, whatever the politically correct virtue signal is that's been put out there. And it, 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 it's, it's continuing, and I, I actually think it's only going to get worse as we move forward. Well, so it's, it's obvious uh, that there are uh, many more cases of obesity and things like that. Um, you know, just childhood obesity, you know, late stage obesity, like di- type two diabetes, all kinds of heart problems, cancer problems, just, um, you know, all kinds of health things are getting worse. Uh, but what, what do you say to the people that are like, but I like eating pizza and I like, I like all of, like, how do you, um, how do you convince people like that, that, uh, don't necessarily, I mean, maybe see some of the evidence, but don't necessarily believe you that that some something is actually wrong with the food supply as opposed to, you know, just people being less self-controlled. I like pizza, <laughs> like donuts. I like all these things, but you have to make a decision, right? And mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of the foods that we've come to believe it's see as foods and sources of nutrients are actually addictive drugs. Uh, I investigated at great length the sugar industry for this book, and one of the things I discovered was not only how they, before fiat came into the picture to manipulate these dietary and nutrition studies, how mm-hmm. they they took the hold of that. They really, they really, they funded a lot of science that wasn't science. It was PR, 
to make sugar seem good and healthy. Mm. Uh, sugar's an addictive drug. Mm. And in the 1700s, we ate about four pounds of sugar a year. Mm. Today, it's 155 pounds plus. And that doesn't include the effects of high fructose corn syrup, which due to the, its makeup has a significantly higher effect. Or the fact that sugar back then in the 1700s before it was processed, it, it was more diluted. It included like a little bit of fiber. Mm -hmm. It included some other things. So it, it wasn't just the direct hit. Sugar today is processed in much the same way cocaine is, mm -hmm. where you get the finest essence of the plant. And I mean, I would try to, I, 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 the, my, I look, I, I, I'm somebody who loves these foods, but what I would implore your audience who's skeptical more than anything, just try it. Mm. Try eating nothing but animal foods for, give it, give it 15 days. Mm. Just see how you feel and then come back to me and tell me you felt better on, on, on uh, Earl Butts' diet of sugar, grains, soy and corn well uh, have you tried it and have uh people around you your family friends done it and wh what's been the experience uh for well, you? i've been primarily carnivore for about um two years now i i have week weekday week week points right where i go off of it i mean i'm still drinking coffee too which it's hard to get off coffee um i'm, tr <laughs> I'm in the process of trying that but one thing i've noticed is my cognitive ability has increased quite quite a bit to the extent where so when i'm taking notes i have my notes here and i'm typing them in i could remember more sentences to, mm -hmm. to transfer it might sound like a little thing but it's really interesting to me also i'm part of a basketball like uh I, every saturday i host this uh like that, that's where you got one. your nose thing yeah was, i had it yeah. last night I, I i played like ass but um <laughs> i got everybody significantly younger than me and i got beat up quite a bit on my on my nose <laughs> but i feel i definitely feel the effects of it in terms of my my mood mm. my mental i'm not up and down i'm pretty stable and my cognitive ability to to retain information has increased substantially over the past past year and a half um so i i may i have i hate to say cheat day like when i'm on vacation or when it's something i'll introduce new foods and i'll feel great for a day or two and then i'll feel oh i gotta go back mm -hmm. right now i'm in the middle of a new book so um i'm really strict because i know i can't do the work i need to do while eating you know, cinnamon toast crunch bars ice cream or pizza <laughs> like i can't do it mm. So there, there's something about it that gives you sort of like that mental clarity. How, how about like the composition of your body and like, I don't know, uh, have your doctor said anything about your diet? <laughs> like what, what do they think? Jimmy, I don't have doctors. <laughs> I don't go. I've never, I haven't been to a doctor in over a decade. I got, well, I got bit by a dog and I had to get an antibiotic a few years mm -hmm. ago, but I haven't been to a doctor in about 10 years aside from getting bit by a dog. So I, I'm not worried. I feel really good. I run every day. Mm. Um, I, another thing that kind of, <laughs> another thing that kind of came to me into research for this book was that, you know, the medical community is very intertwined in this whole system. Mm. So I've become increasingly skeptical of modern medicine. And I think the more I stay away, the better I'll be. I mean, there's extreme circumstances where I would go see a doctor, but aside from, from those, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big believer in preventative care in mm. terms of going to a doctor for that. My preventative care is like a half gallon of raw milk every day. Mm. Um, I don't, I feel really great. So I kind of let that lead me. If I don't feel well, maybe I'll, I'll consider, but I don't, I'm not one of those people who like have the, the watches with the charts and shit. I just, I run every morning. I've run every day for, um, it'll be 10 years in June. I haven't missed a day. And that's kind of like my checkup. If my run is really shitty, I'll be, mm -hmm. oh man, I have to adjust something. But um, on carnivore, my run feels best. And has it been easier to keep up with something like that, like an exercise regimen because of the diet that you have? Or is it is it more just sort of like a habit? It's more of a habit at this point mm -hmm. going on a decade, but... Um, my run times are better on carnivore than mm. 
even if I introduce plants, because I can't, it's hard for me to moderate plants. I'll buy like those cuties, you know, the little oranges and I'll eat, I'll eat 15 of them. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I just, I'm best when I'm, I've, I think I have some compulsive tendencies. So I'm best when I'm just straight meat, mm -hmm. cheese, some raw milk. Which makes sense. Cause if, if you, if you see it like as a drug, very few people can, you know, I, I can stop at one hit or something like that. That's, that's not a typical thing that most people can do. So, uh, it, it makes sense that, uh, you know, especially if you were previously addicted to it, that it would be very hard to like sort of moderate once you, once you get a hit of that, um, sugar or carbs or whatever it is. Yeah, totally. And, and when I was younger, I was addicted and my parents were good parents, but, um, they believed the credentialed experts, Jimmy, they believed that, you know, the best and the brightest were telling us, I, I grew up in the nineties, so I was under the food pyramid. And at that point, <laughs> um, the best and the brightest were telling us to eat, eat eight to 11 servings of grains a day and to not have any set, almost saturated fat needed to be up at the top with like sugar. Right. Mm. So I ate everything. I ate tons of seed oils. I was eating all this shit. I was, I was obese and I got, I got cancer as a teenager. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I was, I was out of commission for about a year and a half. It was very aggressive. Um, osteogenic sarcoma in my leg. And I remember laying in bed, the hospital bed, uh, just like asking my doctor, like, how, how did I, what did I do? How did I get this? And he's like, well, we don't know how cancer is caused. It's, it's mm -hmm. probably genetic, you know, but we're not really sure yet. Well, now I'm pretty sure that I was sick because of what I was eating mm -hmm. and what I was consuming. And um, it took me a while to realize that. But I intuitively knew I had been abusing my body. Of course I was. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think... I think it would have been more surprising if I could eat the amount of just shit and my body would have responded in a positive way. And I mm -hmm. kind of look at that as a, a big wake-up call for me because while I didn't realize – this was when I was 17. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that carnivore was the way, but at that point it began like a health journey for me. So while I was a reporter for the New York Daily News, while I was doing all these investigative stories across the country, I was also on the side doing like – exploring health. So I went through a period where I, I, I read about veganism and tried that. I, I couldn't, I, I, I made it 10 weeks until I just, I, I couldn't, I felt awful. I felt terrible. I mean, I, I had no energy. I was getting always hungry, hungry. Yeah. always hungry. And now I understand why, you know, now I get, Oh, okay. That's why I was always hungry because I, I wasn't getting the nutrients I needed. So I was always foraging, continuing to forage. Like, like a baboon, you know, mm. where their 95% of their diets are plant-based. So mm. they constantly have to eat to maintain their energy. So all day they spend eating. And that's what I'd become. Mm. I'd been foraging all day. Mm. Uh, so that didn't work. And I tried juicing and various things. Nothing worked. And uh, carnivore was a revelation for me. But it was counterintuitive. Because though I've always been cynical of power, I always assumed I didn't like, wait, what? The nutrition <laughs> people are lying? That's crazy. Well, when you understand the history of dietary health in America and you understand how that food pyramid came into being and currently how the USDA and the Department of Agriculture, they're captured by industry. I mean, just this isn't a conspiracy. Go on their website. Look at their partners. PepsiCo, Dannon. They're simply PR campaigns that are doing the bidding of their paymasters. It's, it's, it's what would be shocking is if these studies sponsored by sugar industries would be promoting not eating sugar, right? Like mm -hmm. that's what would be the shock. I didn't realize this until later and Fiat Food, writing Fiat Food just made so many things come together for me. Writing this book wasn't as much to get this information out, although I, I appreciate that it did and I'm getting amazing response from this book, but it was a journey for me to just understand what the fuck happened. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so we were we were talking before the show about like uh, the the event where we hung out and uh, you know I think it was uh, the having party on um, I think it was April twentieth or something like that. Uh, and the and the thing that you you uh, told me right before was that you felt like you can actually talk to people about this. Uh, that so many people in society today do not share anything of your worldview. So. What what do you think is going to wake them up, right? Like, what, cause it, it is a little bit frustrating um, because the standard American diet is just so standard, right? It's it's a lot of sugar, a lot of carbs, a lot of uh, processed foods, seed oils, things like that, which are which are bad for you. Uh, like, how 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 do you deal with that? Because I imagine in your line of work and investigating and writing books and things like that, you meet a lot of people that just have no idea and I mean I guess you could say here's my book you should read it uh, but like what what other strategies do you have to talk to them about it? I'm sure many of us have loved ones for example that are eating very badly right going down the wrong path and maybe they have type 2 diabetes or something like that what what what's your suggestion for dealing with that at the personal level I think people respond best to just your example hmm. and i always i'm 46 and i always have a bit of shock sometimes from other adults who are like man you play basketball really hard don't you ever worry about getting <laughs> hurt i'm like I, I don't get hurt and then that opens it up for me like well what hmm. do you do you i here's here's sort of my regimen but unfortunately i think people have to experience a, a health crisis almost like I did. I don't know mm -hmm. if I would have been on this path if I wasn't always curious as to why I got sick and, and what I could do to prevent. I'm in remission now. I've been mm -hmm. for over 20 years, but what I can do to prevent it from coming back to ensure mm -hmm. that it won't. And for a lot of people, we rationalize what we want in life because the foods we eat make us feel good and they serve as a drug to get us through another moment, even though even in the medium term, it has damaging catastrophic effects for us. But in that moment, when we're having that mouth pleasure, it all makes sense. And we've structured a lot of our life to rationalize why we should do these things. And I do it too sometimes still hmm. less and less, but I do do it. So I think the main thing that we can do is just like, so maybe like what you're doing, Jimmy, is great. Like through your book, um, Fiat Ruins Everything, which is fantastic. I the audio book, which was like in that voice that, mm -hmm. but I, I found it very entertaining um, and very insightful for me. Just the, like, cause you took it from really a base level of Fiat and how it corrupts all these different influences. But so you might have a lot of people who are interested in economics tuning in now who really haven't thought much about diet. And mm. even if we can get maybe three people who listen to this and then mm. they make those lifestyle changes and then they're like, holy fuck, this is cr it's, it's a biggest <laughs> life hack, man. And mm. then once because nothing that we can say can really explain how well we feel. They need to experience it themselves and then share it with others. Because when I first went through this, I almost felt like I'd gone, I'd, I'd discovered this life hack and I needed to share it with as many people as possible. But when you begin talking, you see the look and you feel like, <laughs> ah, they're not listening anymore. This hasn't gone mm -hmm. well. Like I've, mm -hmm. I've gone to the point where they think, well, now I'm saying that, well, no, the Minnesota coronary survey has shown that saturated fat, the theory that saturated fat found in meat raises cholesterol, which leads to higher mortality rate. That almost the, the exact opposite is true. And they're mm -hmm. like, but you've lost them, right? You just, mm -hmm. you just lost them. So I think like you're fit, like you look mm -hmm. really fit. I think you're having a podcast, you're having me on anything. I think just one by one, maybe we, we try to convert people, but it's not going to happen unless they try it. They have to mm -hmm. try it. Two weeks, mm -hmm. 15 days. <laughs> So get get uh, I, I guess your message is uh, get them to become curious by being a good example. Yeah. And when when they're ready, they'll ask you, and then you can you can sort of guide them along. I think I think in my life that's been my best. Um, but still, there's people I really care about who are very sick and not. There's nothing I can say. Mm.
because I, I almost feel like it's like trying to get people off of smoking or drugs or something like that. It's or alcoholism. Like you, you need like almost an intervention or like a come to Jesus moment or something like that for them. That that um, it's very kind of hard to get, and you know, despite the obvious signs that they're sick. Yeah, and you know what, Jimmy? Like honestly, I don't, I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. In a sense, that it's, it's not their fault. In it, because to be able to make really good decisions in life, you need the right information. And what's happened over the past 50 years, as I've chronicled in my book, and I brought up the Minnesota Coronary Survey, so I'll use that mm-hmm. as an example. Um, to rewind a bit, when Ansel Keys made this discovery that saturated fat found in meat causes high cholesterol, which causes heart disease. He did this in the backdrop of the 1950s when every heart attacks began happening and everybody was really freaked out. The president of the United States, Eisenhower, was in the hospital for a heart attack. So if this can happen to the president, this could happen to anybody. Everybody was extremely freaked out and everybody was racing to find the cause of these heart attacks. So Ansel Keys, who was not, um, you know, he was an, not a uh, heart doctor and he was not a nutritionist. He had this theory that it was saturated fat was the culprit. But it was only a hypothesis. He couldn't prove it. So he did observational studies, which we mentioned earlier, which couldn't establish causal relationships. And there are a lot of competing theories at the time. A guy named John Yudkin had a theory that it was sugar and found a higher correlation in his mm-hmm. studies that it was actually sugar that was the cause. Ansel Keys pushed back on this and through force of personality was able to really dominate the field of nutrition. Mm -hmm. He became part of the American Heart Association, which by then was almost completely funded by a $1.1 million award from Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. Um, So they were captured a bit and he was able to really steer the conversation away from sugar and towards meat. And then this became turbo boosted, you know, when we went off the money printer by the government subsidies. But he really was irked by the fact that there was no good data on the fact that on his theory. So what he did was he was like, look, we'll, we'll have the biggest study ever. And it's going to be a clinical Double blind mm-hmm. research study, and he did this in 1968. It was called the Minnesota Coronary Survey, and it lasted for five years. And in it, he had um, psychiatric wards where he could control the variables. So this would really establish a causal relationship. So he felt he fed half the people diets that were low in saturated fat, and the other half high in saturated fat. So 1973 rolls around. And people are wondering, well, where's the results of the study? They were never published. They mm-hmm. never came out. Fast forward to uh, 2016, uh, a, New York, a reporter for the New York Times became curious. Whatever happened to that multi-million dollar study in 1968 to establish a causal relationship between um, meat and heart disease? It never happened. Because by then, we had accepted all these premises already. Hmm. Well, they were able to get in touch with one of the researchers, Ansel Keys was, was a co-researcher, the main researcher who had died, but his son was around, went into the basement, found all the data. Hmm. And it revealed, shockingly, to, to the scientific establishment that not only did it not validate Keyes' assumption, it turned out that low cholesterol was associated with better health outcomes. I'm not, No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm high, getting high cholesterol. Yeah. High cholesterol was associated with better out- health outcomes, while low cholesterol was associated with higher mortality rates. Um, Gary Taubes, who's done great work in this field, at one point found one of these researchers and asked, "Why didn't you make this public?" And the researcher responded, "It's not that anything was wrong with this study. It's just that we were so disappointed in the results." <laughs> so if you think about this. This came, this study was done 15 years before 
the dietary guidelines of 1992 were issued that were based on these false assumptions that then got weaponized into the public school system through school lunch programs. And we shifted school lunches from like whole milk and chicken nuggets fried in lard and whole cheese to seed oils, high sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, that whole milk was substituted first with low fat milk. Nobody liked it because it tasted horrible. <laughs> so they then infused it with sugar and strawberry, just mm -hmm. sugar. So if you grew up in the 90s like I did, by the time you came out of high school, you were already me metabolically compromised mm -hmm. and addicted to sugar. So I guess this is a long way of saying that I, I have a lot of sympathy for these people who continue to eat this way because they've been lied to for 50 mm -hmm. years. And in writing this book, one of the things I'm trying to do is not just explain to them how they've been lied to, but I bring the receipts. I have over mm -hmm. 200 citations. I cite these studies. I show the links and I make what I consider to be an extremely compelling argument as to how we were manipulated in all the different ways. Well, the, the thing that I, I really uh, appreciated about your book is, uh, you know, you, you go really deep into Ansel Keys and it's kind of like an Anthony Fauci kind of character for me in the book, uh, just somebody that sort of has a particular agenda and is able to keep the rest of the establishment in line on his point of view, uh, no matter you know what, what other data sort of comes, comes his way. And that, um, that sort of like bureaucratic terror, uh, if, if, if I may call it that, uh, see, it seems to be sort of like a, a pattern within uh, the fiat monetary system. I, like, I, obviously, uh, we, we have something like Anthony Fauci, um, someone that, that was able to control like the NIH and to some degree the CDC for a very long time. Um, Ansel Keys for me was, uh, you know, from reading your book, it seemed to be that sort of character. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about his motivations and what, what your take on this guy was? Um, very bright, very bright young man. He had trouble in school for a bit, mm. bit of a free spirit. Um, but then once he, he started like he studied saltwater eels for a while, but then once he began tackling nutrition, which started be, he developed um, the K ration for World War mm -hmm. II, which was is 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 he was this small package of food that soldiers could carry mm -hmm. for long periods of time that wouldn't go bad, mm -hmm. and that was kind of his forte into nutrition. And he just seemed like a really expert social climber, mm -hmm. where. He entered a field where people were pretty modest in the sense of they let their science do the talking, and he threw a lot of sharp elbows. So when John Yudkin came out, it's like this this study doesn't make sense. Your you know your your science doesn't make sense. It's observational. There's a far higher correlation to sugar, which you could see in the papers, to heart disease than saturated fat and meat consumption. Um, Keyes responded personally, personally attacked him over and over again, attacked his credibility, would say things like, you know, um, I've been to a lot of conferences. You're never mentioned. You know, you're, you're really nobody. And mm -hmm. I was kind of struck by just how personal attacks became part of Keyes' way to devour his competition. He didn't respond with science because he couldn't. Hmm. He responded with personal attacks and it, to me, I think that was kind of like the beginning of consensus science. So up until then, science was you, – you, you, you're you able to repeat, repeat results, right? Um, you, you have a hypothesis, you test it, and then other people test it. And then if other people can test it, that seems more valid. It shifted to 98% of scientists agree. And I <laughs> see that transformation happening under, under Keyes where – it wasn't so much, can you repeat these mm -hmm. results you have, Mr. Keyes? It's Keyes' defense was, everybody agrees with me. You're a minority of scientists. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're insignificant. Look at all these people who agree with my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they were able to kind of gaslight people into substituting and outsourcing their views on nutrition and health to authority as opposed to looking at data. So... Mm -hmm. 
that's where we are today. We have outsourced, many of us, first we outsourced our money to government. Money should be gold or hard currency. <laughs> Bitcoin, I, in my understanding, is better than gold for many <laughs> reasons that I outline in my book. Um, we've outsourced our, our health and nutrition to credentialed authorities, and they failed us demonstrably. <laughs> and I mean, that's why the doctors are like, you know, don't ever go on the internet. Don't do your own research. They're besmirched as like, uh, you know, I, I, last time I went to a doctor, I was pretty healthy. And, you know, my doctor even mentioned to me, yeah, your cholesterol is a little bit high, mm -hmm. but my doctor weighs 300 pounds. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he's wheezing. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, why am I taking advice from this guy? But he's wearing the white coat. You know, and I'm kind of in shock a bit, a bit of this, but it's like, I think one of the solutions comes where we retake our health and we begin mm -hmm. taking responsibility for these decisions that we made. And it begins with, um, you know, if you're not healthy, you can't live in health presupposes independence and the ability mm -hmm. to act accordingly to like stimuli that that's around us. If you're not healthy, you're already captured because you're part of the system. Do you think like a lot of people for them, it's sort of comforting to have the experts back, the, back up their sort of like food choices and things like that. And that way they, it's like a way for them to indulge in whatever sort of food vices that they have rather than sort of think about what would be the right thing to do um, for their health. Yeah, and I think there's also part of it that's just, it's like people work, you know, people don't, mm. I, I, I'm a writer, so I have time to spend a year and a half mm. researching this extensively. Um, other people don't, and I, I, I understand that. So why would these people lie to us? Like why? Mm. But I'll take you to um, January of 2023, big 60 minutes episode um, where, there was a big breakthrough made by Dr. Fatima Stanford, who told and informed the public for the first time that actually obesity has nothing to do with lifestyle. It's a genetic brain disease. <laughs> so that segment was sponsored by the same weight loss drug. Mm -hmm. And the only other expert speaking was a consultant of the weight loss drug, as was Dr. Fatima Stanford. Mm. That same month, the Tufts Food Compass comes out. Now, these are people, Jimmy, who've like spent their lives studying nutrition, food, mm -hmm. what's good for us and what's bad for us. Tufts Food, Pyramid, Tufts food Compass comes out and it, it informs us that Fruit Loops are better for us than meat. <laughs> Chocolate flavored soy milk is better for us than whole milk. Nothing's worse, very, very few things are worse than butter and eggs. This is what we're being told, same month. Mm -hmm. um, two months later, the American Pediatric Association comes out and for the first time ever changes their criteria on childhood obesity to tell us that it's now appropriate for doctors to prescribe that same weight loss drug mm -hmm. to children as young as 11. This all happens in four months, right? So mm -hmm. in my research, I could not find any clue that they had gathered or met or talked but I'd be really naive if I thought there wasn't some kind of coordination there. It mm -hmm. just wouldn't have made sense. But I wanna go back to that thing that Dr. Fatima Stanford said, because I find her to be completely vile and a disgusting mm -hmm. human being. Because in saying that we have no control over our, ob our, our weight and our health, mm -hmm. she's disarming the public from having control over one of the most fundamental parts of human existence our ability to control our health and telling people to outsource that because it's genetic. You have no control. Outsource that to the, to the pharmaceutical companies as she's getting money from the pharmaceutical companies <laughs> on a show that's being sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies with only one other speaker from the pharmaceutical companies. And it's a cycle that goes round and round. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually really disgusting. And it, it's, it, it, it's, if it doesn't anger you, it's, you know, it, it, it should. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's rather sad how many people are just sort of like completely blind to it or they, that's what they want to hear. So they just sort of like listen to it rather than 
going down and looking at the data and looking at what's I or how they feel if they try it and so on. Uh, they they just they don't want to change. Um, that that seems to be the main thing. It, no, exactly. And um, unfortunately, I didn't bring my charger, and I think my my computer might die shortly. <laughs> I, think I have a little bit of time. But one thing I want to mention about why how Bitcoin changes this is. Mm. It's not as much about Bitcoin. It could be any hard currency that worked. I happen to, in my research, just conclude, and I'm not an expert in Bitcoin, but it seems by far the best alternative, is that it's not Bitcoin and the growth of Bitcoin that does it as much as the destruction of the Federal Reserve. So when you buy Bitcoin, you take a shot at the Federal Reserve and the fiat money printer. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you 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 make it you, you by ending fiat you end any incentive to distort the food supply so you don't need to change the food supply to hide the rising cost of food when there is no rising cost of food hmm. from monetary inflation it's unnecessary so it ends that distortion and it will also and all of uh, you know the money flowing to these subsidies for foods that are harmful towards us, like meat, like like corn, soy, and sugar, and it will also end up the, the 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 funding of this massive PR campaign through the Seventh Day Adventist Church to get us to change our our views of health and food, which our ancestors have understood for centuries, and what has worked, and how humans have thrived for generations to become to this place where, you know we're all sick fat and wondering why we feel so awful all the time okay so i i, I want to respect your computer and make sure you don't run out of battery uh but <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> but uh where where can people find you where can uh people get your book um safedina moose has started a publishing house hmm. go to the go to his website uh safehouse.com but it's also available on amazon and um, just a little note here. I, I appreciate people buying the book if they want to know the inside story, but more than anything, just try it. You don't need to buy any books. Mm. You don't need to listen to me anymore. Just try eating nothing but meat and dairy products and animal-based for give it 15 days. And that is mm. the best argument I could, I could give to your audience. Mm. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, people are incentivized to try it after, after hearing all of the, sort of nefarious things that have gone on. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for telling us all about that. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, this becomes more mainstream uh, and there will be, you know, more um, more people reading sort of this stuff instead of what's uh, published by those publishing houses that you've uh, you're familiar with. Yeah, um, thanks, Jimmy. And one quick note is just like when I was in Austin at the Bitcoin meetup, I met you. I was kind of starstruck. Mm -hmm. I've known who Jimmy Sawin was for a long time. <laughs> I've heard you on Sage's podcast. I've read your book. I actually had the audio, uh, your audio book, and I found it really insightful. So um, this has been an honor for me to be on your show and, and just keep up the great work, man. I really appreciate the good work you're doing in this space. You're helping a lot well, of people. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, well, I, you're, you're, you're doing some good stuff, too. So let's... Uh, Let's uh, orange pill the world together, as they say. I'm down. Thanks, man. Thanks, Matthew. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin-native financial services partner, learn more at unchained.com.